Thanks for joining us today for Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our Webinar Wednesday program coming to you live from Washington, D.C. We are uncovering each part of the DFARS, or Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern. As you know, the DFARS are the rule books for contracting with the Defense Department, and we've been moving sequentially. So we started with DFARS Part 201 in January, and we'll be finishing with Part 253 in December. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. They are recorded and can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 450 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions. If you do have questions for our speaker, we will have his information on the last side of the presentation today. Virginia PTAC at GMU offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. If you are interested in learning more, please use the link provided to explore what PTAC can offer. Set-Aside Alert provides up-to-date news, information, and opportunities for small business federal contractors. Their daily opportunities alerts assure you won't miss important sources, thought, and solicitation announcements, providing details so you can jump on the hot ones. Every two weeks, they deliver concise breaking news, events, regulations, and teaming opportunities. And please join the Reston Chamber of Commerce Government Contractors Council for regular meetings. Please contact Alicia Fields with the email shown on your screen if you have any questions. Okay, and now a little bit about us. Um, we work with U.S. federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance and more information can be found on our website. I also wanted to inform you of a new series that we're holding this year. Um, we launched a monthly series called the GovCon Live Q&A Cafe. And this is a live webinar series held each month that takes place on the second Friday of each month this year at 12 p.m. Eastern. We have assembled a group of four panelists who are subject matter matter experts on a specific federal contracting topic. So the panelists will make a short presentation about the topics listed here on your screen, and then take your live questions about that topic. Our panelists include attorneys, consultants, and other industry professionals. And you can sign up on our website under the Q&A Cafe tab. Sponsorships are available. Please email hello at jennifershops.com for a media kit with pricing details. Also, please note that you can use code DFARS for a $15 discount on each of these remain, remaining webinars. So more specifically, um, next month, our speakers will be covering oral presentations, and that will be with Rena Troy, Andres, and Deborah. And then in October, um, our speakers will be covering Set Aside with Anna, Eric, Sai, and Kim. In November, we get into pricing with Michael, Marsha, Tracy, and Jeff. And lastly, in December, our speakers, Shirley, Joshua, Kate, and Brad, will present on M&A. Again, the discount code is DFARS, and you can save $15, bringing your cost to $20 per webinar. I also wanted to highlight an additional webinar we're holding this year. Um, the title of the webinar is Fiscal New Year Kickoff Best Practices, and this will be on October 1st at 12 p.m. Both the sponsor link and the registration link can be found on, our, on your screen and on our website. Um, specifically, um, our speakers will be covering market research, marketing, sales and capture, proposal writing, and compliance. And sponsorships are also available for these for this webinar. Um, please email hello at jennifershops.com for pricing details. Okay, now to introduce our speaker, Ed Delisle. Welcome, Ed. We are glad to have you here with us today, and I'll now turn the floor over to you. 
Hunter, thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I guess it's this afternoon where you are. Typically I'd be in the Eastern uh, seaboard somewhere between Philadelphia and Washington, DC. I happen to be in Anchorage, Alaska, speaking to you today. I was out here to speak at a conference yesterday and I'll be out here the rest of the week. So um, welcome everyone, uh, wherever you are. Our topic today is uh, DFARS uh, part 236, which pertains to uh, construction and architect engineer contracts. Hunter, thank you very much. Here you go, that's our topic for uh, today, and we'll just jump right into it. Um, Hunter, if you wanna advance the slide. Here's our, uh, our little agenda that we're gonna go through today. What we're going to do is uh, go through FAR Part 36, and of course, you know, DFARS uh, Part 236 is a supplement to FAR Part 36. All of, all of it pertains to architect, engineer, and construction uh, contracts and how the government, and in this particular case, the Department of Defense buys those services. And so we'll go through FAR Part 36 and how DFARS Part 236 supplements uh, what is required by the FAR. We'll go through the procurement of architect engineer services first, even though they appear second in both the FAR and the DFARS. Uh, then we'll go through the procurement of construction services. And as we uh, progress through both of those, we will discuss the DFARS uh, sections that are pertinent to each one and discuss how the Department of Defense may do things slightly differently. Advance the slide. So to sort of lay the foundation, uh, there are, of course, 52 uh, parts of the FAR. There is an entire uh, part of the FAR devoted to architect, engineer, and construction contracts, and that's uh, FAR Part 36. Uh, all the policies and procedures that relate to how the government buys those particular types of services are outlined in uh, FAR Part 36 and are uh, extended and discussed further as part of DFARS uh, Part 236. Uh, the basic manner in which the government prefers to purchase those services is together, which would be through a two-phase selection process. We're going to talk about what that means momentarily. Um, but as those of you who are in these businesses understand, that this, these types of services are also very often purchased independent of one another. And so we'll start with uh, two-phase selection and then talk about uh, how the services are purchased uh, separately and how the Department of Defense does that. We can advance the slide. All right, so let's talk about the um, two-step, uh, the two-phase selection process and the two-step process that the government prefers to use if it can, if it's appropriate to do so, which is set forth in FAR subpart uh, 36.3 and we'll talk momentarily about how the Department of Defense um, specifically does some of this as set forth in DFARS uh, 236.3. But generally speaking, what this two-step process looks like is, okay, you have phase one, which is a technical analysis, which uh, pertains to uh, you as an offeror, and uh, how do you as the offeror intend to solve the government's uh, problem as it relates to design and construction uh, of a facility that uh, it needs or it, uh, it wants in some way, shape, or form. And more importantly, do you, does your team, if it's a team, and uh, under these circumstances, it probably is, you probably have an architect and, en and an engineer separate and apart from a construction uh, contractor that will be um, responsible for the actual construction work. But how does your uh, team operate together what are the qualifications that that, that that particular team has? And as part of the phase one analysis, that's where you start. Uh, the technical approach and qualifications of the individual members of the team, the um, performance history of that team oftentimes is very uh, important as part of the technical analysis. If it's a specialized area of uh, construction, it could be uh, it could involve you know, dredging, for example, in addition to other construction-related work that's pertinent to uh, the dredging that might be required as part of uh, a particular opportunity. 
dredging is a little bit different. Usually when we're talking about uh, this type of work, we're talking about vertical construction. If uh, we are talking about vertical construction, there's something special uh, about the building. Perhaps, uh, for example, uh, there is special testing that's going on inside the building that requires that uh, the exterior of the building be blast proof, for example, depending upon what's happening uh, inside the building. These specialized requirements would be something taken into consideration as part of the phase one analysis. Do you have the qualifications? And the way that this uh, process works is it's a down select. So you go from, um, in order to participate in phase two, you have to advance from phase one and prove to the government that you're qualified to uh, perform the work that they need. And as part of a phase two uh, selection process, if you're uh, part of the down select that makes it into phase two, normally, uh, what will happen is a uh, FAR Part 15 evaluation where things like past performance, um, management, key personnel will all come into play as part of selection, and that's also where price will be considered. All of this is done uh, through whatever agency uh, might be um, in need of construction or architectural uh, and engineering services. Uh, and this particular type of process is used. It's uh, something that would be applicable and uh, possible uh, given, given the situation that the agency uh, is presenting. Again, depending upon uh, the situation, sometimes two-phase doesn't make sense. We're going to talk about how these services are procured individually uh, in a moment, but this is how it works no matter what, Department of Defense or otherwise. If we could advance a slide. Uh, from the Department of Defense's uh, perspective, they have a separate uh, DFARS uh, section 236.303-1 uh, that relates to uh, phase one and how a phase one analysis is conducted. And it specifically indicates that the number of uh, parties that can advance from phase one to phase two shall not exceed five. Uh, there are typically, even if you're not in a uh, Department of Defense context, if you're talking about another agency, the Corps, of, well, the Corps of Engineers is a little bit uh, is part of that group. But if you're talking about um, the State Department, Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, they will typically not exceed five when you're when you're going from phase one to a uh, phase two, if it's a uh, phase selection process. But um, in the case of the Department of Defense, as set forth here. Uh, it specifically indicates that the number moving from phase one to phase two shall not uh, exceed five unless there's basically a really good reason. Uh, and as you see here, if the contract value is less than four and a half million, uh, the, the number that may move on is completely at the discretion of the contracting uh, officer. So if it's a small project, it's a little bit different, but anything that's uh, over four and a half million dollars uh, you're you're going to have uh, essentially five companies that are uh, permitted to move on from phase one uh, to phase two all right if we can advance the slide okay so now let's switch gears and talk specifically about architect engineer uh, contracts and how the government purchases uh, specifically architect and engineer services. Um, it's a qualifications-based selection process, and it's a uh, selection process that's been around long prior uh, to the FAR. So going back to the uh, design and construction of uh, historic buildings, you know, the White House, the U.S. Capitol, the Washington Monument, all of the forts and fortifications that were constructed during the Revolutionary Era, Revolutionary Era all of them were uh, constructed consistent with this qualifi qualifications-based uh, selection, meaning that the uh, architects and engineers that were selected for purposes of designing those uh, buildings uh, were selected based upon such a system. So it was based on uh, qualifications first. Are you qualified? Uh, can you do what we need you to do, um, and all of that is taken into consideration prior to price. Back in 1978, 
Uh, the Brooks Act uh, was passed by Congress, and the Brooks Act uh, was um, well, it codified this qualifications-based selection process. And, and what ultimately ended up happening was uh, FAR Council took the um, the verbiage of the Brooks Act and dropped it right in FAR 36.6. Uh, so it's basically verbatim the Brooks Act uh, that you will find in 36.6. And unlike construction, which we'll talk about uh, in a few minutes, but uh, architect, engineer, uh, selection, and procurement is all within the confines of FAR Part 36.6. Right? So for construction, it's a little bit different. You can start in FAR Part 36.2, and within 36.2, uh, you will end up in other uh, areas of the FAR as part of the selection process because construction can be through uh, other avenues, other uh, contracting methods. There could be, it could be part of uh, FAR Part 14, so you can have, that's, uh, you know, sealed bidding, okay, so hard bids. FAR Part 15, contracting by negotiation, is another method by which construction uh, services are purchased by the government. So you have the basic uh, regulatory provisions that govern construction are within FAR Part 36, which we'll get into momentarily, but there are other aspects of the FAR that become important as part of selecting a, uh, a construction contractor. Not so as it pertains to architect, architects and engineers when those services are being uh, purchased individually. Everything you need to know from a selection perspective is in 36.6. We advance the slide. Okay, so uh, DFARS 236.601 uh, sets forth the policy by which the, the Department of Defense uh, will purchase architect, uh, architectural and engineering services. Um, and uh, there are specific notification requirements as indicated here. Written notification um, to the pertinent Congressional Defense Committees are required if the um, services are for military construction, military family housing, or restoration replacement of damaged or destroyed uh, facilities, and those architectural engineering needs exceed $1.5 million. Um, normally, all of this uh, notification occurs way in advance of um, the folks that would actually be providing architectural and engineering services. This is for purposes of contracting, so that the contract, so that contracting personnel within DOD understand what they need to do uh, in advance of um, issuing uh, statements of work, um, requests for qualifications uh, to the public for purposes of buying architectural and engineering services. Okay, if we can advance the slide. Okay, so uh, getting back to the selection process in FAR Part 36, uh, under FAR Part 36, there is a uh, statement of work that's developed by uh, contract and source selection authority along with, um, along with um, uh, boards that are, uh, evaluation boards that are in place for the purpose of uh, assisting contracting in the uh, the selection process those statement uh, those uh, statements of work are uh, then uh, issued through public announcement electronically uh, through um, uh, system for award management um, and uh, other electronic means so that the public understands that the uh, Department of Defense in this case has a need there is a competition that's based on that statement of work and that um, competition is uh, qualifications based. It starts with uh, typically a request for uh, qualifications, and um, the, uh, the the qualifications uh, are uh, are pertain to the technical uh, qualifications, and technical needs uh, of the Department of Defense in this case, and uh, the the information is gathered uh, by the evaluation boards that are uh, created for the purpose of uh, evaluating the qualifications of architects and engineers and the, um, uh, the competition as I discussed earlier at this at this stage at least anyway is um, 
not based upon uh, price. It's also not uh, not based upon the um, the uh, processes and procedures that are set forth in FAR Part 13, 14, and 15, which I just made reference to a little while ago as it relates to construction-related services. The selection process, uh, at least initially with architects and engineers, is strictly um, qualifications uh, based, but it's not the same sort uh, types of qualifications, um, evaluation factors that you find, for example, in FAR Part 15. Uh, make reference to mixed services here. If, if we're talking about a design uh, build situation, the procedures that would be used for purposes of selection would be construction related uh, because the uh, services that are being rendered would be primarily construction based. That's where most of the money is spent in a uh, design build situation. So the selection process would not be based upon these procedures that we're talking about here, but they would be based upon the selection process that we'll talk about momentarily as it pertains to construction related services. Okay, if we can advance the slide. Okay, um, so from uh, DFAR's uh, perspective, uh, DFAR's 236-602-1 uh, um, talks about the fact that evaluation uh, criteria uh, shall be created prior to making public announcement and the criteria uh, and the order importance of that criteria uh, should be understood and developed by contracting prior to there being any sort of an announcement of a need of some sort. So before going public for architectural engineering services, uh, DFARS 236.602-1 uh, is simply telling contracting that uh, contracting must understand how it's going to uh, perform that competition, understand in conjunction with its evaluation uh, board, its professional board, okay, how are we going to uh, select um, the, uh, determine the appropriate qualifications and then select the architectural engineering firms that we want. And then subpart 236.602-70 uh, um, relates to uh, the design of military buildings overseas. And uh, generally speaking, and this is something that relates to construction too, and we'll see that uh, momentarily, there is a preference for US-based firms in certain circumstances, particularly if uh, the work is being performed overseas, uh, that, that makes Department of Defense work a little bit different than other agencies. Um, Department of Defense work that's being performed uh, overseas in the context of design and construction uh, hedges toward the use of US-based uh, companies. And you'll see here, it could be from an architectural engineering perspective, uh, they want um, U.S. firms or joint ventures of U.S. and host nation firms if we're talking about um, uh, contracts that are going to be performed in Japan, NATO countries, or in countries bordering the Arabian uh, Gulf as identified uh, here. So this is special to the Department of Defense's uh, uh, purchase of architectural engineering contracts. We can advance the slide. Okay, so um, going back to the um, the Brooks Act and FAR Part uh, 36.6, um, the uh, required selection criteria set forth in 36.6, you see that here. Uh, this is a recitation of what a an evaluation uh, board, uh, a source selection authority uh, within the Department of Defense, or in this particular case, any agency that's uh, purchasing architectural engineering services will uh, consider and um, uh, use as part of uh, that selection process. Uh, so professional qualifications um, based on whatever the, the type of work is, uh, obviously that's uh, very important. Any particular or specific technical components that are special to uh, a particular project will be taken into consideration as part of uh, what's assembled for um, uh, for public consumption for prospective offerors, um, what's the uh, capacity to perform uh, timely, how busy are you if you're a prospective offeror, uh, where are you uh, located uh, in proximity to where the project will be taking place, 
Uh, there are design competitions that are, are often a part of the process too, and we're talking about conceptual design. So, um, okay, hey, I have a problem. Uh, I have a basic, uh, maybe a BOD basis of design. Uh, provide me with an, uh, an additional conceptual so that I understand as Department of Defense that you understand my problem and you can help me solve it. Okay, if we can advance the slide. And these uh, evaluation boards, which I made mention of, uh, are a requirement under FAR 36.6, and it's no different uh, as relates to the Department of Defense. There's no uh, DFARS provision which alters or supplements this particular aspect of the FAR. So um, the Department of Defense makes use of evaluation boards just like uh, civilian agencies do. Uh, oftentimes, these evaluation boards, which, uh, which vet the qualifications of potential architects and engineers will contain private practitioners. Uh, those private practitioners that are assisting the Department of Defense in the selection process uh, cannot, uh, at some point subsequent, become a part of the performance of any contract that's, um, that, uh, uh, that results from this particular process. And what this evaluation board will do is it will vet all the qualifications of all potential offerors. Uh, it will collect, um, uh, and we're going to take a look at this momentarial, uh, momentarily, uh, forms of uh, SF-330s, uh, which contain qualification information of architects and engineers. Uh, sometimes those SF-330s will be altered for the specific project that's, um, uh, that's under consideration. The evaluation boards will collect responses to requests for uh, qualifications. Uh, they'll often ask for conceptual design, as we just uh, talked about, and they'll conduct interviews, and sometimes there will be oral uh, presentations. And once all of that is done, then they'll rank at least the top three architectural uh, or engineering firms uh, based on the qualifications review that the board uh, performs. And then what the, uh, what the, uh, what the source selection authority will then do is provide a report well the uh, a report will be provided to the source selection authority and the source selection authority will um, typically go down in order and negotiate uh, from uh, the, the first architectural engineering uh, firm uh, down to the third at least the third and if, if they will negotiate price uh, a fair and reasonable price with the architectural engineering firms and the, they will never get to uh, firm number two if they can successfully negotiate with firm number one and they'll continue down the list until they're able to, uh, to negotiate a fair and reasonable price with a, a top rated architectural engineering firm. That's how the process works. It works that way with the Department of Defense, just like it does with um, other civilian aid agencies that purchase architectural engineering services. Okay, if we can advance the slide. I just mentioned SF-330s. This is an example of what an SF-330 uh, looks like, and it contains information um, such as, uh, you know, who are your people if you're an architectural engineering firm, what do they do, uh, what is the experience of your company and the average annual revenues over the last five years, and this is the sort of thing that an architectural and engineering, uh, engineering firm can keep on file with uh, an agency or, or a district within a particular agency that, um, that that firm either has dealt with or would like to uh, work with moving forward. And variations of these forms are used uh, for particular opportunities as those opportunities arrive, uh, arise. Uh, and that is uh, typically as part of an uh, RFQ process. If we can advance the slide. Okay, so uh, peculiar to the Department of Defense and DFARS 36.604, uh, there's a specific reference to the, uh, to the um, need for contracting to prepare performance evaluations of architectural uh, engineering work. Those performance evaluations are to be um, completed at the end of construction, so not at the end of the design phase, but, the end of the, at, but at the end of the construction phase. Uh, and that's for, for the purpose of understanding that the design, in fact, 
uh, can be um, implemented from a construction perspective as, exactly as it's depicted in the drawings and specifications that are prepared by the uh, architectural engineering company. Um, and yeah, uh, also subpart 236.606-70, there is a specific statutory fee limitation of 6% uh, you know, relating to um, uh, architectural engineering uh, efforts for the Department of Defense, and that's based upon the estimated uh, cost of construction. So uh, this is typical to have a, uh, a limitation on uh, the, the fee that an architectural engineering firm uh, can obtain uh, as part of a process like this, when it's working for the government, it's very, it's just very specifically set forth here uh, by the Department of Defense in terms of what an architectural engineering firm can uh, can anticipate. Okay, if we can advance the slide. All right, so let's switch gears to construction. Um, construction is a little bit different, as I indicated with respect to architectural engineering. Uh, the selection process is entirely set forth in uh, FAR Part 36.6, and we talked about some of the DFAR section which supplement uh, 36.6. As it relates to construction and the, the primary aspects of the selection process uh, for construction are identified in uh, FAR 36.2. If you go to 36.2, you'll see a reference, as we see here, to FAR Subpart uh, Subprovision 6.401. Uh, a, which uh, indicates that the uh, that any competition or that any selection uh, of a construction contractor must be consistent with that particular uh, FAR section. That particular FAR section talks about competition. Uh, so, and then the FAR being the FAR, you go from 36.2 to 6.401, and that then directs you to FAR uh, parts 14 and 15 which uh, is uh, sealed bidding and contracting by negotiation, respectively. So uh, what the, all of this is basically saying in this circular way that the FAR sort of uh, brings you from one section to another is that for construction services, generally speaking, the government uh, needs to have a competition, and in that, in that competition should, e should either be um, consistent with uh, FAR Part 14, sealed bidding, or FAR Part 15, contracting by negotiation. Um, Contracting by negotiation is um, probably the, the uh, most popular manner in which construction services are purchased by the government, particularly as it relates to larger projects. Uh, for smaller projects, FAR Part 13 is also uh, used, but um, it's not referenced uh, in uh, FAR Subpart 6.401A. All right, so if we can advance the slide. Okay, so the uh, purchase of uh, construction services is a little bit different than the purchase of other services. There are some things about construction that make it different. One of the things that uh, makes the purchase of construction different is the government's need to create an independent government uh, estimate, which uh, as it states here under FAR Part 36.2, that IGE is supposed to be in as much detail as though the government is competing for an award. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, it's an interesting concept. So before anything goes out to bid, the, uh, the government needs to have a basic understanding as to what the cost is, is going to be. Uh, it's not something that uh, you will typically see. In fact, under the DFAR subpart 236, uh, point 203 that you see referenced under the IGE reference here, uh, it specifically indicates that on the IGE, uh, the uh, Department of Defense has to indicate that it's for official use only. Uh, and that's typical. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that it necessarily needed that the DOD needed to say that, but they wanted to be um, uh, very specific about it, that it's for their use and nobody's use. But what's interesting is um, 236.203 also says that if FAR Part 14 uh, sealed bidding is used for purposes of purchasing uh, construction services, that the IG itself has to be open and read as if it is uh, a 
uh, a bid or offer to the government will be a bid to the government for those services and has to be made a part of uh, of the record, which is interesting. Um, you don't typically see that elsewhere in other um, in other FAR supplements, uh, but it specifically indicates that that's what the, what's to happen if the um, Department of Defense uses sealed bidding as a means of uh, buying construction related services. Uh, so that's a little bit peculiar as it relates to um, as it relates to uh, uh, the Department of Defense and the, the IGE is certainly peculiar to construction generally. Disclosure magnitude is also a little bit different uh, as, it rela as it relates to um, the purchase of services. So when it comes to construction services, the government will provide an estimated range. Uh, and that estimated range, um, you'll see, uh, you'll see some of that here. What the ranges are, what DFAR subpart 236.204 does is extend that range, and we'll see that in a, in a few uh, moments. I have a slide on that, and you'll see it. Um, but it extends the range above the $10 million uh, number that is um, uh, set forth in the FAR, which you see reflected here. Uh, liquidated damages is another thing that's peculiar to construction. It's different than other services. And um, you will have a liquidated damages clause in your contract if you're a uh, construction contractor for the government. And uh, the DFAR uh, subpart that you see here, 236.206, it does nothing more than um, bring you back to FAR Part 11 in the circuitous route through uh, DFARS 211. 0.503 eventually uh, circles you back to FAR 11.502. All of that basically uh, tells contracting how it is to determine an appropriate uh, liquidated damage number to place in a construction contract. All right, so all of this is special uh, to construction, different than other services. And um, yeah, if we can advance the slide, please. Okay, so and, and this is what you'll uh, find in a uh, the ranges that you'll find in a Department of Defense construction contract. Uh, again, it, it extends uh, to ranges above the ten million dollar point, and you'll see that it goes all the way up to uh, five hundred million. And once you get to five hundred million, it's it's uh, it'll tell you that it, that it's expected to be over five hundred million. All right, can advance the slide. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, other aspects of the purchase of uh, construction services that make it a little bit different. As part of the selection process, as part of the uh, due diligence process, the government should, it's permissive, should uh, provide access to uh, a construction site, uh, it should, uh, and that's for the purposes of allowing the pers prospective offerors or bidders um, to uh, understand the animal that they're dealing with, okay, to be able to get uh, a better understanding as to access, a better understanding as to uh, the conditions, uh, that sort of thing. It's uh, typical that access um, site visits are required as part of a, of a solicitation, but they don't, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, during COVID, there is a big issue uh, relating to this, uh, particularly as it relates to renovation work. So, if, so example, I have a client uh, that's, that's performing work in Virginia uh, for GSA, and during COVID, it's an occupied building, and it's, it was going to be renovated, and during COVID, GSA did not want to provide uh, access to, you know, bring outsiders into the building uh, now that's changed over time, but this is June of 20, uh, 2020, so not too long after everything shut down. They, de they did not want to provide access to the building to prospective, uh, to prospective contractors. And that ended up uh, creating issues for my client on this one particular project. Had they been provided access, they would have uh, better understood, um, uh, for example, there were drop ceilings and they uh, they would have had access to what was underneath or above, I should say, the drop ceilings. Uh, and a lot of the work that was being performed was happened to be in those areas. It turned out that there was asbestos, unknown asbestos in those areas, which would have become would have been evident 
had a site uh, walkthrough been permitted and, and that sort of thing, and it wasn't. It became an issue, uh, a big issue, in fact. And so during COVID, you had a lot of issues like that. But based upon uh, FAR Part 36, there doesn't need to be, there doesn't have to be access provided. Contracting should. A lot of times they didn't uh, during COVID, but um, uh, there's also this whole concept of superior knowledge. Okay, so and that was one of the battles in this uh, GSA case that I just made reference to. Well, what did the what did the government actually know? Okay, they didn't give us uh, access, but they didn't have to. However, what did they actually know about the conditions in place? What did as built what as built information did they have access to that perhaps they didn't provide? All of this can become uh, an issue if you end up in a uh, a dispute relating to construction related services. It's important to understand obviously the regulations that relate uh, to those issues. Uh, are you sure? As it indicates here under FAR 36.2, uh, it indicates in this case that the procuring agency, DOD, shall assure that an offeror and the agency fully understand the scope of work as part of negotiations for proposals that are significantly lower in price than the independent government estimate. So if you're way low, there's an obligation on the part of the government to ask why. Okay, and that's part of uh, 36.2. Advance the slide. All right, let's talk uh, uh, specifically about the Department of Defense. Uh, in situations where DOD has opted to use sealed bidding, if there's uh, some indication that uh, there may be insufficient funds for everything that the Department of Defense wants to do in a particular circumstance, uh, what this particular DFARS provision is telling contracting to do is to consider uh, using a bid schedule with ads or deducts. Um, the, the tricky part of doing something along those lines sometimes is to make sure as part of the solic solicitation process that how price is going to be considered is uh, identified. Is, it, is there a, a base uh, bid that the award is going to be uh, premised upon or is it going to be a base uh, plus individual ads? Our deducts gonna uh, come into play as part of that process. It all, it all is important and needs to be considered well in advance if uh, in fact funding is going to be an issue. And as it indicates here, typically uh, you'll use make use of ads or deducts, not both. It gets very confusing uh, if the agency, uh, the DOD, uh, opts to use both. You don't see that, um, you know, for obvious reasons. 236.215, cost reimbursement as it relates to construction-related services is something that the government, um, the Department of Defense, is told to completely stay away, uh, away from, even in time of war. Uh, there's obviously an exception to every rule, uh, but what this is attempting to do is to uh, assure the government that um, there's not going to be a, a blank uh, check uh, available to a construction contractor for purposes of completing performance on a particular project. Uh, you're going to get a firm fixed price uh, uh, contract in most cases as it relates to, uh, to construction. If you advance the slide. Sticking with uh, the DFARS as it relates to uh, construction-related services, 236.270, expediting construction. So basically, it, once a project has been awarded, it's possible if there's a real need, if there's a real emergency or, and, and the national interest uh, requires it, that a, uh, an agency, a DOD uh, agency, can expedite completion of a contract if it's going to impact price, which it most likely will, uh, then there has to be some uh, uh, explanation by the head of the agency as to why it's, uh, it's necessary, why it's in the national uh, interest. And as part of that process, the agency head also has to provide some sort of a reasonable completion date, despite the fact that there's uh, a need to expedite completion. Under two uh, DFARS 236.271, similar to uh, cost reimbursable contracts, cost plus fixed fee contracts uh, are generally prohibited, prohibited or restricted uh, for the same reasons that cost reimbursable contracts are. 
Okay, if we can advance the slide. Okay, so uh, pre-qualification uh, of sources is um, something that the Department of Defense uh, will sometimes do if there's something super complicated or if it's something that's being performed in, er in an area of the world that makes it super complicated, then uh, they'll pre-qualify contractors, very similar to what we talked about um, as part of a, a down select um, uh, with respect to architects and, and engineers. Uh, it'll be a qualifications-based uh, review, and then the uh, competition will continue just based upon those who've been pre-qualified by the Department of Defense. Again, that's, uh, that's a sort of peculiar thing to the Department of Defense. If you advance the slide. Okay, so this is sort of a, a big one as it relates to um, Department of Defense uh, construction work. Uh, and I made reference to it earlier as it relates to architectural and engineering contracts. Uh, for uh, contracts that are uh, in excess of $1 million, generally speaking, uh, they're taking place overseas. This is uh, um, uh, overseas work. Generally, the government is going to want uh, U.S. firms involved in, uh, in that work. Um, you can sort of understand why that might be. Uh, there are uh, certainly instances where other firms, uh, foreign firms, can become involved as part of the construction process and can be uh, offerors. Uh, if, for example, you see reference to it here, prices are the price of uh, coming from U.S. firms is more than 20% higher than uh, than prices being offered by um, uh, firms that are from another country, and that needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, working agreements with foreign countries is also something that's taken into consideration, and it's really important. We have, you know, treaties with, uh, and it's not necessarily DFAR based, uh, but you, we have um, agreements and treaties with uh, countries that will impact how we do services, how we build things uh, for our purposes in those countries. Um, Israel is a is a good example of uh, a, a special manner in which, the special manner in which uh, we perform work overseas that can be different. Uh, when we build things in Israel, we do it through uh, the FMS uh, program, the Foreign Military Sales Program, and Israeli firms play a role in the construction-related DOD work that we perform in Israel. And so when you're talking about overseas work, it becomes very specialized and it, and it, it, it sort of delves into areas well, far, well and far beyond uh, the FAR or the DFARs, and it's something to keep in mind if uh, that's the type of work that you are interested in performing or that you do perform. Advance the slide. Uh, okay, so there are uh, DFARs 236, 274. Um, every, anybody who does um, uh, construction related work uh, for the government understands things like Buy America, Buy American. This is sort of uh, cut from that cloth. Um, under DFARS 236.74 uh, per uh, 274 per uh, the Military Construction and Veterans uh, Affairs Appropri Appropriations Act of 2009, contracting officers are not to permit the acquisition of steel for any project for which American steel producers or manufacturers have been de denied the ability to uh, to compete. So uh, you know, basically, American steel manufacturers. Uh, need to play a role in some way, shape, or form uh, in uh, military construction that's being uh, performed uh, consistent with what you're seeing here. And it's uh, you know, it's something if, if you're uh, performing construction-related services uh, for the government that you need to be aware of. Okay, we can advance the slide. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, the specific contract uh, clauses. So now, as part of uh, FAR Part 36 and DFARS uh, 236, there are also references to um, uh, FAR Part 52, the contract clauses that relate to providing architectural engineering construction services, and the same holds true with respect to the Department of Defense and the DFARS. So these are important also, and so I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, some of the uh, contract uh, clauses, the performance and work requirements. You're going to find this in uh, any unrestricted or nearly any unrestricted uh, construction-related 
uh, contract and the department, whether it's the Department of Defense or uh, civilian agency, it's the same. Uh, they're going to uh, want self-performance of some sort from the prime contractor. You see 12% a lot, and um, what you have is this sort of blank that the, uh, the contracting officer will fill in. Typically, he'll put a 12 in there, uh, but that's something that you have to make sure that you understand and appreciate as part of providing construction-related services to the government. This is a little bit peculiar, peculiar to construction. If it's a construction contract that's been issued under FAR Part 19, so it's a small business set-aside of some type, you should never see this clause in the contract, so it's something to be aware of because the Small Business uh, Administration has its own regulations that are pertinent to uh, limitations on uh, subcontracting. So it's important to uh, understand that if it is a small business set aside, it's construction related, that it's something, um, that this is something that should not be in your contract. So you need to make sure that you uh, bring it to the attention of contracting through an R5 process early, um, early in the uh, solicitation process long prior to submitting a, a bidder proposal. We can advance the slide. Differing site conditions, a uh, really big deal as it relates to construction-related services and the contract clause, um, there's a reference in, uh, in FAR Part 36. Uh, it it, it uh, pushes you to uh, FAR 52.236 relating to site conditions and you'll see um, contract clauses in your contract, whether it's Department of Defense or otherwise, that are pertinent to differing site conditions. If you perform construction-related services for the government, it's really important to understand uh, what those mean. The um, differing site conditions clause is one that I litigate all the time. Uh, I had one fairly recently down in uh, Florida relating to a dredging project where uh, we were told by the government as part of the uh, solicitation process that they wanted us to dredge sediment from the bottom of the Miami River. And uh, sediment is what it sounds like uh, to the uh, to the layman, right? It's it's not bedrock or rock. It's it's sediment. It's mud, uh, basically. And what, uh, but the solicitation also indicated that they wanted the contractor to go down to a particular depth. What they didn't tell the contractor was that that depth would require them not just to remove sediment but also bedrock. So that's a different type of dredging. It requires different equipment, and it created a huge problem. Uh, and that case was litigated as a differing site condition. So that's one example of something that you could deal with, uh, potentially if you're uh, dealing with the government. Differing site conditions don't necessarily have to be uh, subsurface or something that you can't necessarily see. Um, I had one in Colorado a few years ago that pertained to um, a renovation project at a very old um, custom house building out there, and there was uh, undisclosed uh, asbestos within the building, which created a huge problem. It was a different site, differing site conditions uh, matter that eventually ended up litigating and it resolved at some point after litigation uh, began. So very important uh, and something that you need to understand if you're gonna perform uh, construction related work for the Department of Defense. Site investigations, um, we talked about site investigations uh, a little bit earlier as it relates to the government. They should, but don't have to give you access as a contractor prior to uh, submitting your bidder proposal, but what they're going to do based upon 52.236-3 is assume that you know everything that you need to know and did all, that you did all your due diligence so that whatever price you give to them uh, makes sense and that the work can be uh, completed uh, uh, as part of that price. So it's a little bit, in my opinion, a little bit unfair to the contractor, but that's you know, how the regulations are written and you need to uh, obviously understand them to so advance the slide. Uh, I just reference this, if you do uh, construction related services for the government, there's going to be a requirement in your contract that um, you properly and directly uh, supervise that work, have a superintendent on site at all uh, relevant times. Uh, you would think this is very straightforward and obvious. Over the course of the last 12 months, uh, I've spent an inordinate amount of time uh, dealing with this issue and whether or not the, the uh, contractor was appropriately supervising uh, and directly supervising work. Um, don't have time to get into all the details of that, but it's important to understand that it's your responsibility. The, the government uh, is going to require that you have somebody on site at all relevant times. 
uh, sometimes, and one of the issues that I just uh, ran into as well, okay, the government wanted us to have a superintendent on site, but it was a design build project and we were still in the design phase, which didn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense for the contractor. We ultimately ended up getting that uh, worked out, but it's something you need to be aware of if you're going to perform construction services for the government. Can you advance the slides? Schedules are super important. If you're going to perform work for the government, this particular uh, DFARS, uh, or excuse me, FAR, uh, FAR contract clause uh, is something that you will see in uh, both civilian and DOD contracts. The only thing that I'll say really about this is the type of uh, schedule that's identified in 52.236-15 is sort of very rudimentary. You have to pay particular attention to the specifics, the scheduling specifics as set forth in the solicitation to understand what the requirements are for that opportunity because they change. And this is what you see here is very generic. Typically, they're much more specific, so something to be aware of. We can advance the slide. Super important um, and something that construction contractors um, don't understand all the time. The plans are super important to a um, construction contractor, obviously. Uh, the blueprints, the plans, the specifications are going to always take, almost always, uh, take precedence over the drawings. Uh, if, if As long as this particular clause is in your contract, which inevitably it will be, I guess there's a chance it might not be, but uh, the drawings and the specifications, super important. Uh, they're interchangeable, they're to be read together, but the specs will always govern over the, the drawings, something very important to understand. The Spearing Doctrine is also very important to understand if, if it's a design, bid, build project, then you as a contractor have the right to assume that if you build consistent with what the drawings uh, indicate, what the plans uh, indicate, what the specifications tell you to do, uh, that everything will work you know, and you'll be able to complete without, uh, without difficulty. Um, and I say without difficulty, there are always difficulties in construction, it's a messy business, but generally speaking that the design works. If the design doesn't work, uh, for some reason as the contractor and you have no design responsibility, then that would be on the government. And that's what the Spearing Doctrine uh, stands for. And, and you can run in, into all sorts of issues and problems associated with de design if you're a construction contractor. Uh, so, but super important to understand as the contractor, you have a right to rely upon what the government gives you uh, for a fully designed project. And if we can advance the slide. Specific to Department of Defense, uh, DFARS uh, 236.570, there are references in uh, the DFARS to uh, various different contract clauses that could be included in your contract with the government. Much of them, uh, or at least a number of them, are um, the contract clauses that relate to uh, the DFARS provisions that we spoke of earlier. For example, if there's uh, the need to use additive or de deductive items, you see 252-236-7007. That's the contract clause that allows the um, Department of Defense to make use of that particular um, function if it feels that it needs to. Um, uh, same thing with 252-236-7013, uh, uh, requirement American Steel Competition. We talked about that earlier. This is simply the uh, contract provision that implements uh, what we just discussed uh, a few moments ago. Okay, if we can advance the slide. Just very briefly, uh, if you are a construction contractor, the, the changes clause, which is not peculiar to construction, but, it, uh, but is uh, one of them will be in your uh, contract regardless. Super important that you understand which changes clause is in your contract whether you're working for the Department of Defense or otherwise, and understand that, that there could be very specific notice provisions within that changes clause. Uh, but whether there is or whether there's not, notice is super important. Uh, if there's a problem later down the road and you've not provided appropriate notice to the government, it could end up being a real problem for you, particularly if the government takes the posi position that because they were not appropriate, appropriately notified, they were prejudiced in some way. And don't assume like COVID, a lot of people assume that, hey, everybody understands, the government understands that COVID has, is impacting performance. Don't assume it. 
Okay, that's why I placed this, uh, this quote in the slide. The single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place. Don't assume the government understands what problems you are having. Make sure you, uh, you specifically notify them of those problems, whatever they may be. Okay, if we can advance the slide. Okay, and as we wrap up here, uh, I just wanted to talk about this very briefly. This was a, a very big uh, item of discussion for the last 18 months, excusable delay. Uh, one of the excusable delay provisions is probably in your contract if you're a construction contractor, uh, and it covers things like epidemics, quarantine restrictions, et cetera. The difference between uh, the application of the changes clause, for example, or differing site conditions clause and this one, this one only gives you time. It is not compensable. Okay, so this may help you, but it may not necessarily completely help you if you run into a problem, but it's important for you to understand. All right, advance the slide. All right, well, I thank everybody for, uh, for participating today. If you have any questions, there's my information. Thank you, Ed, for a great presentation and for sharing your time with us today. Um, and like Ed said, make sure to reach out if you do have any questions with the contact information on the screen right now. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us for this webinar. Um, the recording will be on our website and YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. And please join us next week as we cover more parts of the DFARS. Have a good one, everyone.